Greetings, it's the Digital Dog, and today I have a three-part tutorial. What I want to talk about is the benefits of working with a wide gamut RGB working space and how that can affect your final output to print. This is a video I wanted to put together because of the controversy over different RGB working spaces, and so let's see how the rubber hits the road and how wide gamut spaces actually affect our printed output. So as I said, there's going to be three parts to the video. In part one, I'm going to actually show you output on a print that was created using Profoto RGB working space and the same images output using sRGB on an actual output to an Epson printer. The subtleties of the differences will not necessarily preview all that well over the internet. So Part two, I'm going to provide you with a file that you can use yourself to test output to your own printer, and I'll show you exactly how to go about the testing methodology so that you yourself can see the benefits of working with a wide gamut RGB working space out to your various output devices. And part three is going to be geeky, and it is absolutely not required reading or viewing, but it's uh, going to go into detail about why we're going to see these differences on our output devices when we use a wide gamut RGB working space versus using a very narrow RGB working space in terms of gamut like sRGB. So let's go through the first part. I want to point out that all of the photographic images started from raw data. They were all captured on either a Canon 5D or 5D Mark II. The exception are two synthetic images that were built in Photoshop. One is called Bill's 14 Balls, which is an amazingly fantastic synthetic image created by Bill Atkinson to show the effect of all kinds of issues on output, whether it's profiles, smoothness of gradients, and in this case, uh, the effect of these RGB working spaces on the final output. All of the images were rendered into Profoto RGB using uh, Adobe Lightroom. And I should point out that when you use an Adobe RAW converter like uh, Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw, the underlying imaging color space that these products use is using a Profoto RGB size gamut. It's a cousin of Profoto RGB. There's only a very slight difference in terms of the gamma. But otherwise, if you're working with raw data in an Adobe RAW processor, you're working with Profoto RGB gamut. Basically, what I did was I made a copy of the gamut test file from Profoto RGB and converted it to sRGB into Photoshop. So now I have two versions, one in Profoto RGB, one in sRGB. And then what I did was I output both files in the two RGB working spaces through a custom ICC profile for my Epson 3880 using luster paper. I used a relative colorimetric intent. And what I'm going to do is show them to you side by side. What I did was I photographed both of the prints under a GTI uh, viewing booth with a 5D Mark II. I shot the print side by side in RAW. And there were no edits applied to either image in Lightroom other than I built a custom DNG camera profile for the light booth. And what I'm going to do is show them to you side by side in uh, Lightroom in the compare mode and go over what I saw under the light box so that you have a better idea of what to look for when you make your own uh, test prints. So let's go into Lightroom and take a quick look. Okay, so when you download the file, it will look just like this. Um, on the left is the print that was printed to the Epson using Profoto RGB. On the right is the image printed using sRGB. Otherwise, they are identical. And what I'm going to do is just go over some of these images very quickly and give you an idea what to look for when you make your own prints. And again, because you're viewing these images through the internet, it's going to be somewhat difficult to see the big differences that I see on the prints themselves. But if we look at this image in the upper left, we'll go from left to right. Uh, the big difference, and you may be able to see it here, is the saturation and detail in this uh, cyan blue background of which the piranhas are sitting on. Um, on the left, we have Profoto RGB. This is very, very dramatic visually under the light box. And again, I don't know that you'll see it as well over the internet. The color saturation is extremely intense on the left side 
in the pro photo RGB image versus on the right an sRGB. Very, very dramatic. They really, really pop. And these are important colors, these cyans and blues that we're going to look at, because a lot of the images that you capture are going to be of blue skies, which have a lot of these similar colors. If you go outside during the day on a clear day and look at a blue sky, you'll see deep blue as you look up into the sky and as it gradates down towards the horizon, you'll see it move into these sort of blues and cyans. And this is where there's a really dramatic difference between using these two workspaces when you output files. So when you make your prints, you definitely want to take a look at this difference here. Over on this right side, these images here of these colored fabrics are again very dramatic on the prints. I don't know that you'll see them quite so well on the internet, but one of the big differences that I see in the Profoto RGB image on the left versus the sRGB image on the right is this detail of the cloth looks sharper and almost looks like it's almost a little more open in the shadows. And again, the only difference is the encoding color space that we used. The colors in sRGB seem to clip into less detail that you can see on the print. So one of the things that you'll notice when you look at the print from the Profoto RGB image is these blue and yellow green pieces of fabric um, really seem to pop and look much sharper and have much more detail. The other thing that I don't know that you're going to be able to see on the video, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. It's difficult to see from the photograph, but on the prints, one of the things that you're going to notice when you look at them side by side is that a lot of these very saturated colors seem to have much more gradation and detail from the Profoto RGB image, whereas over on the sRGB image, they seem to sort of look like someone took the blur tool or the smudge tool in Photoshop. You don't see the detail uh, due to the size of the color gamut being squashed down. Now, if we move down to this image here, this is called a Granger Rainbow. And this is a synthetic image that was built in LAB. And so it's not a real photograph, but it's very useful for looking at color saturation and also smoothness and gradations. And I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see this again on the internet, but on the left, the green is much more saturated. And it's also very, very smooth here in this area of color space where over on the sRGB version on print, it's not as saturated, and I actually see some banding going on here. And I'll talk about in part three of the video why this is happening, why when you take your raw data that has a very wide gamut potential and squash it down into a very small color space, you'll end up seeing this type of an effect. You'll also notice, again, the blues, uh, quite dramatic difference uh, between the smoothness and saturation of blues and cyans on the left side versus on the right side. This particular image has a lot of greens. And again, this is another area where it doesn't necessarily show up so much on screen, but it will on your prints. And I see a very dramatic difference in these shorts on this gentleman in the pro photo RGB image on the left versus on the right. You won't see very much difference in the skin tone, which is an interesting attribute to look at when you examine both prints, because these skin tones pretty much fall into the sRGB gamut. So you're not really seeing much benefit there. Now, these are very interesting gradations that were built in Photoshop. These are called linear gradations, and they gradate from maximum saturation to white. And as you can see, I have yellow, red, green, blue, cyan, magenta. I think you may actually be able to see this on screen. The magenta gradation is much more saturated. And the other thing that I can see is a much bigger difference in the cyans in the Profoto print versus the sRGB print. This little thing here looks like sensor dust. The other thing that I notice is blues, which again are a very important color when you're capturing and printing your work. Although I don't think you will see it here on screen, it's definitely visible on my print, even with my custom ICC profile. The blues seem to have a bit of a magenta shift to them in the sRGB print. They look much more saturated and much clearer or more pure uh, from the Profoto RGB image. So if you've ever printed out 
work and you've noticed that your skies or areas of blue seem to shift slightly magenta, that could actually be due to the compression of the gamut going from a wide gamut space from your raw file into sRGB. I'm also noticing significantly cleaner and more saturated yellows in the pro photo image. But again, what you need to do is print them both out and look at these examples on your print that I'm pointing out to you. Now, where things get really interesting is in Bill's balls. These are synthetic images. If you look at them before you convert them, they look like spheres. And here's a really dramatic difference again in our cyans. On the left, we have much more saturated cyans. I'm seeing a little bit of a band here in this particular part of the image. But over here on the sRGB image, it's just washed out. There's no detail. It's very, very difficult to see what looks like a sphere. Uh, interesting, there's virtually no difference in these uh, neutral balls, as one would expect, because they fall completely in gamut. If you look over at the magenta and the yellow, the magenta looks much more saturated from the Profoto print versus the sRGB print. It's much smoother. I'm seeing some banding here as the compression of colors doesn't do a very good job mapping. The yellow is smooth, but it's much more saturated in the Pro Photo print versus the sRGB print. And then if we move over here, let's look at the, um, the red. Very smooth here, very saturated. Here in the sRGB print, I'm actually again seeing this circular banding. It looks like it's shifting slightly magenta. So it's not as smooth and it's not as pure. And once again, we see a big difference in green. Uh, the green here is much more saturated. It's very smooth the way it gradates from the maximum green into this highlight over here on sRGB. It's not as saturated, and we're seeing again some banding here due to this compression of our colors. And last but not least is our blue, which looks much smoother and much purer. There's far less of this magenta color cast that you will see on the particular print. So I wanted to go over this very quickly just to give you an idea. You want to download this file, add your own images if necessary. Uh, I'll show you in part two how to do this. And then make a print each way and take a look at them very closely. And I think you'll see a very dramatic difference in print quality based on which RGB working space you begin with. Okay, welcome to part two of the video. In this part of the video, what I want to do is give you an idea how you can test the wide gamut printer test file on your own to your own output device. So what you want to do is you want to use the gamut test file to test your output. And in Photoshop, what you're going to do is you're going to duplicate it and give it a custom name, maybe call it sRGB. And you're going to use the convert to profile command to convert it into sRGB. So down below you can see the dialog box if you use the convert to profile command. I'll show you this in a second. And you can pick either relative colorimetric or perceptual because the way things work in Photoshop, it doesn't make any difference. You're going to get a relative colorimetric conversion whether you pick one or the other. And I would recommend that you always have black point compensation on. And the particular image you're going to download does not have any layers, so you don't have to worry about the flattened image to preserve appearance. Down below, you can see the URL where you can download this particular file. I'll leave this up on screen for a second, but it's up on my website, and it's just called gamut underscore test underscore file underscore flat dot TIF. So it is a flattened version of this image that you saw in part one in Profoto RGB. And what you're going to do is you're going to print the image from Profoto RGB and sRGB identically. Uh, and if you are willing to sacrifice four sheets of paper instead of two, I recommend you use a perceptual rendering intent and also a relative colorimetric intent. You will see some differences on each print. Then examine both the prints as I outlined in part one. So that's the basic uh, premise of the testing methodology. And of course, if you have your own images that you want to add to another page or on top of that particular test file, by all means do so as long as they start out in Profoto RGB.
So once you have the images set up in Photoshop, and you have an sRGB image and a Profoto RGB image, I want to quickly go over how you would use the print dialog in Photoshop. This is, uh, of course, going out to my Epson. And the first thing that you want to do is set up your print settings and pick 8.5 by 11 sheet paper. It's important in the Epson dialog to pick the right media setting. So in the case of this particular uh, test file and prints that you saw in part one, I was using the premium photo luster paper. Notice in the print dialog, it tells you what the profile is of the image that you're about to print. So this would be the Profoto RGB image. We're also going to print out the sRGB image so that we have one of each to look at side by side. We want to make sure that the color handling is set for Photoshop manages color. And here's where you're going to want to pick the ICC profile that you have for your paper and printer combination. Here I have one that I built for my particular printer, a custom profile, but you can use uh, the CAN profiles that came from Epson if you have an Epson printer or one from Canon if you have a Canon printer. In this case, you're going to pick the rendering intent. In the images that you saw in part one, the test prints I made, I used relative colometric, but I would recommend that you print one set using perceptual as well. You will see differences. And then finally down below, there's the soft proofing options. It's really not necessary whether you have them on or off. All that's going to do is affect the preview of the screen uh, that you see on the left here. It's not going to affect the printing at all. Now, if you're working with an outside lab or a print provider, you're going to need to get their ICC profile, and you're going to use the convert to profile command, which is seen here, to convert from both Profoto RGB and sRGB to their output profile. So in this particular case, you can see that I've selected a profile that was supplied from a print house that uses a LightJet 5000. And uh, again, you can see very similar to the print dialog uh, from the previous slide, we're able to select a rendering intent. Uh, so you can pick a relative color metric and or perceptual and send both of those files out to the print provider. Once you use the convert to profile command, make sure you save a copy. You don't want to save over the original. So do a save as, uh, give it a descriptive name, something like, uh, in this case, I would probably save it as LightJet 5000 perceptual, and then I would save one as LightJet 5000 relative color metric, and send them both to my lab. Now, if the lab only accepts files in an RGB working space, this test may not work for you. You need to be absolutely sure that they will not convert other RGB working spaces to sRGB before they make their prints, or it'll invalidate the test. So if you send a lab that says they'll accept Profoto RGB, a document in that color space, and their front end converts it to sRGB before it's printed, the two prints are going to come out and look the same, and the test is not valid. Now, I do want to talk very quickly about the assigned profile command and the idea that people who are working in something other than sRGB, for example, Adobe RGB or Profoto RGB, will end up with dull colors. And the reason that people see this has nothing to do with the profiles, but rather user error. So the assign profile command allows me to open up a document. In this case, the image on the left is in Profoto RGB and lie to Photoshop, tell Photoshop, this image isn't Profoto RGB. These RGB numbers are really, in the case of the image on the right, sRGB. And as you can see, if you look at the background of the fish or if you look at the cloth, colorful cloth images, the image on the right looks dull and desaturated. And the reason for this is simply because of improper color management. So the image on the left is Profoto RGB. The image on the right was converted to sRGB, assigned Profoto RGB, and you can see the opposite effect. It's overly saturated and looks really ugly. So the bottom line here is these ICC profiles, when incorrectly assigned to data, will either make an image appear desaturated or oversaturated, and the result is going to be, of course, poor output. And this is simply user error. It's simply assigning or treating the data incorrectly. If you have Profoto RGB and the data is embedded as Profoto RGB, everything will be fine. If you have sRGB and the data is embedded as sRGB, everything will be fine.
There's nothing inherently wrong with these particular color spaces. It's a bit like going to buy shoes and you wear a size 10 and then buying a pair that's a size 8 or a size 11 and wondering why they don't fit. You did something dumb. You ordered the wrong shoes. Okay, if you made it this far to part three, hopefully you'll see how you can potentially produce much greater quality output using a wider gamut color space and test your own printer. So now part three is for the color geeks. And so if you have no interest in understanding uh, why under the hood we're seeing better results with the wider gamut, then go ahead and move along, no problem. Uh, go ahead and make your test prints and see what you see. But for those of you who want to know what's going on, let's go into this a bit deeper. There's an urban legend that Profoto RGB has more colors than sRGB or Adobe RGB has more colors than sRGB, and that just isn't true. The number of colors is an attribute of the encoding of a pixel. So with an 8-bit per color encoding system, we can define 16.7 million colors. We can't see anything like 16.7 million colors, but we can define them numerically. And that's one of the things I want to talk about in this part of the video, among other things. One of the things to keep in mind is that when we're talking about a very large gamut RGB working space like Profoto RGB, as you can see down below, that isn't visible outside human vision. And if we can't see it, it's not a color. And that's a very important attribute to keep in mind. Gamut is a range of colors. It has nothing to do with the number of colors. That's the encoding of a pixel. In fact, the gamut of an RGB working space is really nothing until you add pixels to it. It's just a container for color. Now, it's important to understand that we can define colors numerically that we can't see as being different. And again, if the colors look the same, they're the same color. And here's a perfect example. What I have on the left is an RGB pixel in sRGB that has a value of 2, 255, 240. And you'll notice the LAB values, which are based on human vision, which are 90, negative 54, negative 8. The pixel just next to it has an RGB value of 1, 255, 40. And it has the same lab value. Those two numbers define two different color device values, but they're the same color. When we look at them, they look the same. And so it's very important to understand that when we talk about colors, we're talking about something that happens deep inside our brain. It's in a perceptual attribute. And this is one of the reasons why we can define numbers that don't necessarily attribute themselves to colors that we can see. Again, 2, 255, 240, and 1, 255, 240 are the same color. They have the same lab values, which is based on human perception. They have two different RGB numbers, but they're the same color. The disconnect in color spaces, why bigger is better. When we talk about RGB working spaces, it's important to understand that they're based on theoretical emissive displays. They're not based on the print. They're based on something emitting from a display system. Even though some of these displays aren't even real, they're just theoretical. And they reach their maximum saturation at very high luminance levels because that's how we make color with light. Very dark colors of very intense saturation do occur in nature, and we can capture them with our cameras. But many of these dark saturated colors fall outside of even Adobe RGB 1998, let alone sRGB. And so when you capture those very dark but saturated colors, and then you try to encode them into a emissive light-making color space, what happens is when you go to print them out, they sort of form solid blobs of color on the print. And this is what I believe you're seeing when you look at the two prints of the fabric image I showed in part one. The reason why the Profoto RGB image appears sharper and has better color contrast versus the sRGB image. Here's a URL where you can go and look at the following gamut map that I'm going to show you. And this is basically what I've done to create this gamut map. Here what I've done is I've taken one of my images from the gamut test file and I've converted it into sRGB and Profoto RGB. Then it was converted to the print output space going out to the Epson 3880 luster. So what you're seeing here in this gamut map is essentially one of the images treated just like the prints I showed you in part 
one of this video. The red dots are the sRGB image that was converted to the Epson output profile and printed. The green dots started as Profoto RGB. They were converted to the Epson output color space and plotted. And if you look carefully down in the bottom right, you can see there is a greater range of green dots that are further apart compared to the red dots. And what's happening with these red dots that represent the sRGB image is this clumping of colors that are all getting mapped to very similar values going out to the Epson printer profile. Whereas if we start with the wider gamut color, we have a greater range of dark saturated colors that we can map to the print output color space. So this is the reason I believe that you see the saturated colors on the fabric image printing sort of as a solid blob of saturated colors from sRGB where the colors that were printed from the Profoto RGB image have a much better range, they have better color contrast, and thus they look a bit sharper. Here's another example. It's all about clipping. What you're seeing here is sRGB in the center, and we're comparing part of the gamut to Profoto RGB. Again, what you can see is that the Profoto RGB gives us a much larger range of possible colors that we can map to our printer output color space. The colors that are in red that are outside sRGB are going to clip by virtue of simply encoding from our raw data into the smaller sRGB color space. Now, again, keep in mind that the red that you see here is simply a container for colors. This doesn't mean that all of the red that you see here are colors that we would be able to print. But we have a larger range, a bigger container that allows us to take these saturated lighter colors in this case and print them. Now there are downsides to wide gamut color spaces. And you hear all the time people question whether or not it pays to work with a wide gamut color space because there are colors that fall outside your display gamut. And it's true. You have to make the decision. Do you want to capture and print all the colors that you may not be able to see on your display but can print? Or do you want to clip those colors just so that you can see them all on screen? So let me explain what you're seeing here. Basically, on the left, I've taken my Profoto RGB gamut test file and I have brought it into a product called ColorThink and I converted a copy of that to my display profile which is a PA272W uh, NEC Spectre View. This is a wide gamut display that is approximately the gamut of Adobe RGB. And what I can do in ColorThink is I can have it show me visually the differences between those two color gamuts as to what I would see on screen or what I couldn't see on screen, so to speak. And that's what's represented in that funny looking image on the far right. Anything that's green is a delta E of less than two, which means the two appear virtually identical on screen. Anywhere between two and four is yellow, and you can see the areas that are yellow that would be more difficult for me to see subjectively on screen. And then anything above a delta E of eight appears red. So those are the colors within the image in Profoto RGB that I would not be able to see on my wide gamut display. So it's true when you're working with wide gamut colors that fall outside your display gamut, there are colors that you could be editing that you can't see on screen. You can see the very saturated colors in the Granger rainbow that are represented as red or several of the balls in the lower portion of the image that are very dark and saturated appear red in the far right. And I would have to be careful when I'm editing those images on screen in either Photoshop or in Lightroom. Now here's a little trick to help you out. Let's go here into Photoshop and we'll use this particular image. And what we'll do is we'll just call up <coughs> Hue Saturation. And this can work in any of the products that you might be working with. If you start moving one of these sliders and you all of a sudden see as you move the slider the image on screen stops updating. You don't see any change on screen. It's very likely that you're affecting colors that are out of display gamut 
but are still being altered by this manipulation of a slider. So be very careful when you're moving these sliders on wide gamut data like this, where the colors don't appear to change on screen, back off that slider a little bit, because you might be manipulating colors that are changing that you can't see on your display. Ultimately, you need to ask yourself this question. Do you want to capture colors that you could reproduce but maybe not see on your display and use them when you make your print? Or do you want to work with a color space that clips those colors so that you can see them all on screen but then may not be able to use them when you make a print? That's the question only you can answer. But I think after you make those test prints using sRGB and ProPhoto RGB and looking at the prints up close, it'll be easier to make that particular decision. I want to point out that as printers evolve, their gamuts increase in size and your ability to print these saturated colors will be more likely in the future. What you're seeing here, the green blob is the color gamut of the Epson printer, the 3880 luster paper profile that I built. And the dots are an image that you see in the upper right of this very colorful flower. And as you can see, there are yellows that fall outside of the printer gamut in very bright areas, and there are very dark saturated colors that fall outside this particular printer gamut. Well, this is an Epson 3880. The Epson 4900 has an even larger color gamut. And as printers evolve over the years, we'll see even larger color gamuts become available for our use. So if you're capturing raw data and you encode in a big color space like Profoto RGB, you'll always have those colors at your disposal as the printer gamuts increase, as printer quality gets more robust, and you'll be able to take advantage of those particular colors. If from the very beginning you put your raw images into a smaller container, a smaller RGB working space, you'll clip those colors and they'll be unavailable for your use forever. So I just want to remind you of another video that I did previously covering color gamuts and images. If you want to get a better idea of what wide gamut color spaces are able to capture and contain compared to print output spaces, go to this URL and check it out. Thank you very much.